Welcome to the podcast series at the College of Education and Integrative Studies. My name is Jeff Pass. I'm the Dean of the College. And our guest today is Dr. David Newman, uh, Associate Professor of, of Education. Uh, and Dave has been uh, a faculty member for five years now, I guess entering his fifth year. And uh, Dave, we're delighted to have you with us. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, Dave, uh, we're here to uh, talk about and celebrate your recent publication. But before we do that, uh, let's get a little bit of background on uh, what you do and, as uh, at the College of Education. Sure. So uh, I'm a teacher in the credential program. So I help prepare teachers who are primarily going to get their secondary credentials, which for, for those outside the education field, that would mean people who are going to teach middle school and high school. Uh, my primary area of specialization is history, social science, education. Uh, I do some other things, but that's kind of the main story. So uh, your book uh, is, a, is a historical book uh, rather than one about education per se, although in reality, every book is about education to some degree. Yeah, I think you could you could make that case. So uh, I came to the the field of education primarily through my own experience as a former teacher and then as someone who ran professional development workshops for K-12 teachers uh, rather than through my professional training. My professional training is actually in uh, in history. So my Ph.D. is in history and this book's an outgrowth of my dissertation from USC. So. Uh in a nutshell, tell us about uh, the book and what it's about. Uh, so in a nutshell, the book is, is both a biography of a particular individual who lived in the early 20th century and spent most of his time in the U.S. And, and is also, uh, through that biography, a vehicle for understanding how yoga came to be um, popular in the United States in the early 20th century, uh, long before the period that I, I think stereotypically people tend to think about it. Uh, and as a religious practice, not not just as sort of a physical or mindfulness practice. And the title of the book is? Uh, you're putting me on the spot. Finding God Through Yoga. You always have to have uh, both the title and then an 18-word subtitle. Uh, um, Paramahansa Yogananda, who's the individual's name. Paramahansa Yogananda and modern American and American religion in the modern age. Yeah. So that's... Uh a lot there, so we have <laughs> quite a bit of unpacking to do, but we've got a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So how did you come across Yogananda and his uh, teachings? So uh, in my graduate study, I was pretty interested in looking at the role of religion in the United States in the 20th century, particularly in Southern California. Uh, and I became intrigued by individuals who were uh, practitioners of yoga uh, and uh, students of Hinduism. And uh, there was a forerunner of Yogananda, uh, Swami Vivekananda, who's been written about quite a bit. And uh, I was struck by the fact that Yogananda really had not been done uh, appropriate service, uh, despite his significance and his impact. Uh, the organization he founded is, continues to be uh, headquartered in, in Los Angeles and is a global organization with uh, branches all over the world. And hundreds of thousands of people have read the autobiography of a yogi that he wrote. And so I was really surprised that uh, he hadn't really been studied extensively and it felt like it was, it was a perfect topic to take on. So you began that study uh, of his life during your graduate program? Yeah, that became the center of my dissertation uh, in, oh, probably 2014 or thereabouts. Um, and in the beginning, it was, it was kind of a matter of trying to determine whether there was material that was accessible. So he, he wrote quite a bit, um, but the organization that he founded, Self-Realization Fellowship, um, doesn't generally make their materials available to the public. So, uh, so then the challenge became figuring out whether uh, a viable biography could be written without access to some of those materials, as, as I thought was going to be the case. And had you ever written any kind of biographical studies before? Uh, so I had done a research paper on uh, an African-American minister in Los Angeles uh, in the, and he was, he moved to LA during World War II. He was prominent in, in the area between World War II and the early 60s until he retired. I didn't really think of myself as someone who was interested in biography before, but that was, that was how I, 
sort of got my feet wet with with that experience and then uh, and then took off with Yogananda and tried to figure out how to tell a, a larger story through his life story. So, so you had two purposes there. One was to tell his story, but then uh, all of the significance and uh, the context uh, also has to be part of the tale. Yeah. So how does one go about uh, doing a biography? Uh, where do you start? That's a really good question. Um, I think as I came to think about it, it really is a sort of uh, iterative process. That is, I, I feel like there's a lot of movement back and forth between life story and context. I mean, the one helpful thing about a biography is that it does at least give you some basic skeleton about how to organize the book. I mean, it's it's possible certainly to write something that that runs out of chronological order, but sort of the natural tendency is to write a biography that that follows the the lifespan of the individual. Um, but even then, um, where to introduce relevant background, um, whether to weave it in or to have sort of uh, an introductory chapter that was all context before introducing him, all of that was challenging. And then sort of uh, because he died in the early 50s, how far forward to go after his life, uh, how much of the story was still relevant about the, the impact and, and the influence he, he left. And a lot of the, what you had to read was uh, Indian, I presume, uh, written in other languages? No, fortunately, this is one of the, the beautiful things. Uh, I did, in order to travel to India, I did uh, learn a very, very modest amount of Hindi, but even that wouldn't have done me um, much good. Uh, Yogananda primarily spoke Bengali, uh, and, and all of the sacred texts in India are in Sanskrit, which... Um, is the the modern language that uh, that's spoken in most of northern India is is Hindi, and that's um, that's an offspring of Sanskrit, but is significantly different. Now, if I had if I had been uh, reliant on my Sanskrit skills, we would we would all be in trouble. One of the interesting things about people like Yogananda and Vivekananda is that because of the British colonial presence, uh, to be part of the elite and to be educated was to be educated in institutions that had been founded by the British, and as much as anything, there, there was a huge debate about this in the early 19th century, but it was educated Indians themselves who lobbied for language instruction in English so that they would have access to the, the tools of, of colonial power. So, mm -hmm. um, so he wrote and spoke uh, almost entirely, well, in his public ministry, Yogananda wrote and spoke most entirely in, in English. So you also had to, I presume, study about India uh, during that period of time when it was a British colony and all of the things going on in India and the world at that time? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, really placing him in the context of uh, British colonialism in India and the relationship between um, Indians, but particularly elite Indians, that is uh, people who um, had connections to the government in some way. So for example, Yogananda's father was a member of the civil service. So uh, really understanding the role of British colonialism in shaping Indian identity and, uh, and the ways in which modern Indians, uh, so people from the 1800s on, uh, and, and particularly religious Indians reflected on their identity in light of the British colonial presence and, uh, and often the critiques that Europeans and Americans uh, lobbed at India, Indians, and Hinduism. And so uh, a big part of what people like Yogananda were about was articulating Hinduism in, in a way that responded to the, the critiques of Christians, but not just Christians, also philosophical un um, utilitarians and, and so forth. So yeah, a lot of context about British colonialism and then the sort of transnational relationship between the US and Britain uh, and British India. Right, so that's pretty rich. And then there's the whole theology layer of, uh, of Hindu and, uh, and I guess yoga as a uh, form of Hindu. Yes, so um, yeah, so yoga is, is essentially I mean, actually, yoga is a word that that has all kinds of meanings. Um, but in terms of the the sort of uh, discipline that we think of, I would say that's a, a subset of the larger set of uh, Indian traditions that often get subsumed under the label of Hinduism. And once you get into this 
conversation, it can get really murky. There's a lot of debate about how we define Hinduism and whether whether giving a single label to the range of religious traditions in India that lay people typically think of as Hinduism, whether it's even appropriate to give a single label to that variety of religious traditions. So yeah, there was a lot of uh, wading into that and, and really attempting to, to make sense of uh, Hinduism in its own terms, but also as it was being interpreted in, in a modern sense. Every religion is a living tradition. So looking at the texts uh, from two or 3,000 years ago by themselves doesn't tell you everything you need to know. Right. And uh, I myself have been studying yoga for 20 years or so. And, you know, I've been uh, introduced to many of the uh, classical texts. And it's, uh, it's a very different way of thinking than uh, Western religions. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, so trying to understand a religious and philosophical tradition that is not either the one that uh, most Americans are raised with um, actively or by default, right? There's a sort of vague uh, Christian tradition that many Americans are familiar with and imbibe whether they realize it or not. Sometimes we talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition, which is, is also a problematic term. But yeah, I think there are um, very different set of beliefs that you need to do justice to in, its, in their own right. And in a sense, uh, your book is about that very clash, is it not, when he uh, introduced uh, yoga to many Americans? Yeah, so, uh, you know, he came to the United States in 1920 at a time when um, white Protestant Americans uh, who still, you know, dominated culture and politics in many ways were reacting to the immigration of millions of Southern and Eastern Europeans, um, including large numbers of Jews. And there was a lot of racism and xenophobia and so forth. So in, in many ways, uh, for an Indian Hindu man to come to the U.S. and try to pitch uh, yoga practice uh, was, was kind of a tall order. And he faced some prejudice and he, he had a really intense experience in Florida where uh, he was almost lynched, and I think he didn't really understand at the time how close he came to that. He had uh, maybe a bit naive of an expectation about what life in the American South was like, particularly as he was trying to do private training in, in, uh, in most cases, in women's homes. So you have a, um, a foreign man of dark colored skin uh, teaching women privately in their homes. And as I said, that that almost ended very, very badly for him. So there was that that dimension of things. Uh, and part of the way he responded, uh, apart from try, trying to avoid the most contentious circumstances, was trying to articulate Hinduism and yoga in an, in an idiom or a language that would make sense to a predominantly Christian public, even if it was only like a vaguely Christian public, as I said before. And what made him so successful uh, in view of all of the obstacles that he faced? So I, I think he had, uh, he had a number of things going for him. One of them was uh, a strong sense of pragmatism. So there was, there was a willingness to make modifications to practice that some purists found offensive. So for example, he invited Americans to engage in meditation by sitting on a chair. And some of his colleagues back home in India just thought this was a, uh, a fundamentally unacceptable compromise. And he said, you know, Americans are not used to sitting cross-legged on the floor, and this is just, a, this is too much for them. So there's a pragmatism to, to him. Um, he was very energetic, very creative about uh, adapting modern tools, uh, communication. He had a, a radio program. He had, as we might talk about in a bit, um, a correspondence course on yoga. So he made use of modern communication tools. And uh, I think he was really aggressive about marketing. So one of the chapters in my book is really about the link between the market and religion. And while a lot of scholarship has been written about uh, the emergence of the connection between American Christianity and the marketplace, um, a lot less has been written about the history of people like Yogananda, who were really good at packaging his 
training in a way that was appealing to people. He, he put out ads that basically said, hey, this is a practice that will make your life better in every way. It will help with clarity of mind. It will help you be more productive at work. And look, you can do it a little bit at a time. You can have a 15 minute stretch where while you're waiting for the train, uh, commuting to work, you can, you can get a little bit of this done. So, and was this his own individual brilliance or did he have a team that uh, worked with him on the business aspects? Uh, he certainly had uh, assistants who helped him think about uh, how to market. Um, but I do think there was a certain intuitive sense that that he had uh, individually as well. Uh, he he was by all uh, records a pretty charismatic person. I think that helped a lot. So when he did public performance uh, performances, when he spoke publicly, there was a kind of theatricality about it, and people talked about uh, his luminous eyes and his physical presence. He had a kind of self-deprecating sense of humor, and all of that really helped as well. So. Even with the assistance he got with marketing, I think without without his own presence, it wouldn't have gone very far. Uh, were you able to find uh, video uh, archives of his uh, work? Not not much. There there are small snippets of usually only a few seconds, um, but it is enough to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, of his personality and the way it came across. Uh, and then some of that's from testimony of disciples who described uh, often the the presence. Again, they routinely commented on his eyes. There are some audio recordings of him, uh, mostly to disciples and mostly later in his life. So I'm not sure that you get the full sense of energy he had when he was a younger man, but it, it still conveys something of his, his sense of presence. So when did he, uh, or how did he hit it big? When did he make the big leap to becoming... Uh, the uh, renowned leader that he became? Um, I, I think you probably have to think about it in a couple of steps. So he came to the U.S. in 1920, and he uh, he got some, uh, he came to a conference of religious liberals in, um, in Boston, and he established himself there, but he didn't really hit it big until, I would say, 1924, 25. That was when he started to gain momentum, and a lot of that was in his relocating from the East Coast to California. Um, so that was pretty significant. Uh, he talked about the greater LA area as the Benares or the Varanasi of the West. So essentially uh, bestowing the, the most sacred uh, Indian city title on Los Angeles. He never quite spelled out what he meant, but he seemed, he seemed to, to suggest that there was an openness or a warmth toward him that he didn't experience other places. So when he established his national headquarters here, that was a pretty significant step. He did gain a benefactor in a man named James Lynn, who was a retired businessman and millionaire. And, and James was a sort of disillusioned individual by the mid thirties. And as Yogananda's organization was floundering a bit in 1935, the middle of the great depression, uh, he met Lynn, and Lynn became a, a quick disciple and then a benefactor, and that really helped the organization grow. And then I think the last major step within his lifetime was the publication of Autobiography of a Yogi in, in 1946, which has been in continuous publication in many languages ever since. What made that book so great? Um, it... The way I think of it is as sort of uh, creating a world that he invites people into. Calling it an autobiography is almost misleading in some ways because it, it gives very few details about his life. I mean, as much as anything, it's a spiritual journey. Uh, and most of the questions that you would typically want to know about someone aren't answered in there. But what he does is essentially usher readers into this enchanted world where uh, swamis might levitate or they might be in two places at one time, or you encounter an individual whose head has been cut off, but he's walking around carrying it in his hand. Um, and I, I think many people found the, the vision of this uh, kind of enchanted world really attractive. And he's describing India that way, but, but he essentially says, or implies at least, that if you follow him or the teachings that he makes available, you, you can experience this kind of enchanted uh, world as well. And can I just say, 
really okay. quickly, um, I, if I don't clarify this, enchanted will sound negative probably. This is a language of, of Max Weber who, uh, who wrote a lot about how the, the modern industrial world disenchants the world and removes the sense of the supernatural from its spirits and angels and demons and that sort of thing. So when I say enchantment, I mean that in the positive sense of a world in which transcendent realities are possible. And what was the reception uh, of the public? Uh, did you go through uh, book reviews and other kinds of articles about it? Yeah, it, the, um, as you might expect for a kind of book that I described, the, the reception was a mixed bag. I think a lot of the... Um, a lot of the book reviews were not especially positive. There was a lot of skepticism about the things that he reported. Uh, but there were also some reviews that that saw it as how the book is a, a helpful entree into uh, basic concepts about Hinduism and yoga for a public who who didn't really know it. Um, but I think you know the book was popular despite its critical reception for the most part, rather than because of it. Uh, as as is often the case, the public at large didn't really care much about what the professional book reviewers had to say. And um, who bought the book? Was it a, a general uh, bestseller or was it within the Hindu community or within the yoga or just on the West Coast? Um, I don't have figures in terms of like uh, sales within within different parts of the U.S. Uh, and in terms of who was more attracted to it, most of that's fairly anecdotal as well. Um, certainly the people who were purchasing the book were by and large uh, white Americans. I mean, there there was almost no Indian American community to speak of at the time that he was in the US. Um, but judging by the kind of people who were his followers in life and then people who became his most notable disciples, they were definitely uh, middle class, generally upper middle class people, uh, disproportionately women, and then often people who had had some introduction to metaphysical traditions outside of, of uh, what we might consider mainstream Christianity. So people who'd been introduced to theosophy or Christian science um, or other, other traditions like that. So it's fascinating to me that there's always been a segment of the public that uh, was looking for uh, texts like that. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly uh, it caught, it must have caught uh, his followers by surprise when yoga became uh, such a big uh, fad, I suppose you'd use the word, in the early 2000s. Yeah, and then I think there's... Um, then the organization, I think, has made an effort to convey that... I think there's less of a sense of, hey, we had it all along than to say uh, the way that it's practiced may not be the full story. So so Yogananda himself was never much for the asanas that uh, that sort of constitute much of modern yoga. Uh, it's not that he was opposed to them, but he didn't really think they were the essence of uh, yoga. And for him, yoga was primarily about communing with the divine. It was about a meditative practice that got you to ultimate transcendent reality. And that's why I entitled the book Finding God Through Yoga. I really wanted to highlight the fact that that was, that was distinctive. So I think more contemporary followers as, um, you know, Global International Yoga Day has come around and various anniversaries of Yogananda's birth um, or the founding of his organization have come around. Leaders of the group have tried to highlight what was distinctive about uh, what he was saying about yoga. Was there a rivalry between uh, him and other uh, leaders in the field? So again, most of this is uh, sort of anecdotal, but uh, when I looked at a particular study of, of um, other yoga figures who had been preaching in locations where Yogananda was, particularly in Southern California, what I would find was that even when he was clearly in town at the same time, um, he didn't go out of his way to meet up with them or chat with them and so forth. Um, so I don't think he was aggressively hostile to other groups, but there was a, a measure of proprietary interest in having people sign up for his correspondence yoga course. There's not, he's not part of some religious denomination that has its own financial backing that will keep him going. He was reliant on subscribers and purchasers of his book to keep his ministry afloat. So I think there's just a, a practical dimension of 
uh, needing people to be drawn more to him than to uh, someone else who is who is preaching about yoga or teaching about yoga. Would you say that he became wealthy? Well, um, he always talked about um, the fact that he didn't own anything himself, um, but certainly he had access to and made use of, um, you know, he had an automobile and that sort of thing, but mo most notably he had access to wonderful pieces of property all throughout Southern California. Uh, probably most notably the retreat, the ashram that's still in Encinitas. Um, if anyone who's ever been to Encinitas, you, that, that whole town is very uh, yoga influenced. Uh, and that's, that's primarily because of Yogananda. Um, the headquarters in, in the uh, hills above Highland Park, that's a pretty prime piece of real estate. Uh, he has a temple in um, Hollywood and another um, ashram right right outside of Malibu. So he certainly was pretty savvy about recognizing uh, prime prime real estate and mm -hmm. inviting his benefactors to invest in that real estate as you know as lovely meditation centers and and so forth. So and and I think he would argue that they become a kind of uh, advertisement for the organization as well. And as I've visited those various places, they they even today are places where people might stop by just because it's lovely. And while they're there, they might pick up a brochure and become interested in self-realization fellowship. So uh, let's switch the topic to you now. Uh, how did you change as a result of this uh, endeavor? Huh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think the most important point kind of is goes back to what we talked about at the beginning that I, so my own background is in Christianity, not, not in Hinduism. And uh, I originally thought when I first went to grad school that I'd be writing about some aspect of the Christian tradition in Southern California. And, and my concern at that point had been making sure that I wasn't so much of an insider that I wasn't doing justice to the material. And, you know, what I found in the process of doing this was it was precisely the opposite. And, and in that case, I wanted to make sure exactly the same thing, that I was doing justice to material that um, was part of a tradition that, that I am not directly a part of. So I, I really tried to handle the story as respectfully as I could. Um, so I think that's, I, I don't know if it changed me, but I was aware of the challenge of, of doing that well. And I, I think as those of us who are interested in history recognize that empathy is really central to what, what I think the history as one of the humanities has to teach us, recognizing that we don't know a position that we're not a part of, but through the act of imagining, we can do our best to try to understand it better and then be open to feedback to see if we've gotten it wrong and then try to try to do it more accurately. So I think there's a, a kind of ethical responsibility there. So when you teach your uh, methods courses to people to who, who are going to teach history in middles and high schools, um, what do you share with them as a result of this experience of writing the book and being a real historian? Hmm. So, uh, it's underscored the, the larger point about the importance of teaching empathy, that I want my own credential students to embed that in their own practice so that when, when they're teaching middle and high school students, they are encouraging those kids to have empathy. I think that's really, really significant. Um, and then I've tried to, I've made a couple of lesson plans based on materials from the book. I've tried to model that as a way of showing students that they can teach to the standards, which is what we're always concerned about, but that that doesn't that doesn't leave them stuck with the kind of mainstream stories that we always think are uh, what the early, for example, the early twentieth century is about. And so part of what I'm trying to model is if there's a topic that you're passionate about or interested in, uh, you can weave that into the larger narrative if you if you do it attentively. And then part of uh, the lesson planning that, that I tried to model for my students is to show them the ways that um, that historians engage in interpretations. We, we make interpretive judgments. And one of the ways I do that is by posing 
three or four, I can't remember how many it is, at least three different accounts of one event. And one of them is by Yogananda himself, but all three of them are, um, are not easily reconcilable. And so I create a fairly simple task where the students are asked to weave those three primary source accounts into their own narrative of what happened. And that gives them some firsthand experience of the kind of interpretive decisions you have to make when there is no decisive uh, answer as to what actually happened. Right. And even then, one must be skeptical. So uh, as a social studies person, I can say uh, teaching about empathy and teaching about multiple perspectives is the core of what we're trying to do. And some might be critical and say, well, that's not what the standards are all about. Those are people who haven't read the standards. So you're doing the right thing. And uh, I'm glad to see that your book has been so successful. I encourage others to check it out. Uh, and uh, David Newman, uh, thank you for joining us today uh, on our podcast. Thanks so much again for having me. I appreciate it. Okay.